In this course, we're very interested in how the distribution of two or more random variables depend on each other. We do this by mainly considering the so-called conditional and joint distributions. Additionally, we're also interested in knowing the so-called marginal distribution, which is the isolated distribution of a single random variable where we have removed the influence of all the other variables. All of these are central in the understanding of our nonlinear filtering methods. In this lecture, we will define these distributions and look at how they are related to each other. We will also look at an illustrative toy example, including all of these distributions. We start by looking at conditional distributions, which are indispensable components in sensor fusion, filtering, and Bayesian estimation in general. And we define them like this. Let x and z be two random variables with the joint PDF p of x, z. So p of x and z. Now, the conditional density uh, function, which you read as the probability density of z given x, is defined through the so-called product rule, which states that the joint probability of x and z can be written as a product of these two densities. So the conditional density of z given x times the marginal distribution of x. This implies that for possible values of x, that is, values of x which has non-zero probability density, we can write the conditional density of z given x as the ratio between the joint probability of x and z divided by the marginal of x. So we normalize the joint distribution of x and z with the probability of x to get the conditional density of z given x. Now, typically, we view this here as a function of z, and that x is just some known constant value. In our case, this is usually the value of some measurement that we have already observed. To make this a bit more obvious, we could rewrite this expression as p of z, where x is equal to some x prime. So x prime is just some constant value. Then we get p of x prime and z divided by p of x prime. Now, as x prime is just some constant, then p of x prime is also some constant, and p of x prime comma z now only depend really on z as x is some constant, so we can view this as a parameter in this function here. So in principle, we take the joint probability density of p of x prime and z, and then normalize it with this constant of the probability density of x prime. Now, as we're typically interested in this as a function of z, in many cases, it's beneficial for us to view this as proportional to the joint density. So the conclusion here is that the conditional density of z given x is proportional to the joint density where we have fixed one of the dimensions, x in this case, and then view it as a function of z. And the interpretation here is that p of z given x describes the distribution of z given that x is known. So we don't have any uncertainty about x anymore. x is equal to x prime in this case. We know this. Let's look at the toy example to hopefully make things a bit more clear. In this toy example, Sarah decides every day how many pieces of candy she can have for an after-lunch snack. Now, to make things a bit more interesting, she decides how many candies she gets at random using an intricate scheme involving both tossing a coin and rolling a dice. So with 40% probability, she tosses a coin, where if it ends up at heads, means that she will get one piece of candy, and if it gets tails, it means that she will get zero pieces of candy. However, with 60% probability, she throws a dice, and whatever the number on the dice is, that will be how many candies she will get that day. Now, if we let Z denote the number of candies that she eats, what is then the conditional probability that she eats I candies, given that Sarah tosses a coin, or that she throws a dice? Well, let's look at the conditional probability here. So we condition on that Sarah tosses a coin. So we have no uncertainty regarding which method that she uses to determine how many candies that she gets. Now, if we know that she tosses a coin, we also know that with 50% probability, she will get one piece of candy, and with 50% probability, she will get zero pieces of candy. 
With this information, we can describe this conditional density or conditional probability like this. We have 0.5 probability that she will get one or zero candies. And then 0% probability that she will get any other number of candies. Similarly, if we know that she throws the dice, the only uncertainty that we have left is regarding the face value of the dice. If she rolls a 1, she gets 1 candy. If she rolls a 2, she gets 2 pieces and so on. And as she has a fair dice, she has equal probability of getting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6 pieces of candy. And the probability of this is 1 over 6. We can thus express this conditional probability like this. So 1 over 6 probability if i is equal to 1, 2, and so forth, up to 6, and 0 probability otherwise. The next thing that we will look at is marginal distributions, which we get by using the law of total probability. Now there are many important results in nonlinear filtering that is obtained from the law of total probability. So I highly recommend that you get yourself familiarized with it. Now, the law of total probability or the sum rule is defined like this. Let's say that we again have two random variables, so x and z, which has some joint distribution like this in the discrete case or like this in the continuous case. So if x takes values in some set Sx, the law of total probability states that the marginal distribution of z, which we write like this in the discrete case and like this in the continuous case, can be found from the joint distribution by summing over all the possible values of x in the discrete case or integrating over all the possible values of x in the continuous case. We can interpret this as we are marginalizing out the influence of x by summing or integrating over all possible values of x. So what is left is the marginal probability distribution that now only depends on z in this case. So we're marginalizing out x from these joint distributions. Now there's also a common and equivalent way of expressing the law of total probability and that's by splitting these joint probabilities using the product rule into these two factors like this. So these two are equivalent forms of the same law. So let's return to the can example and try to find the marginal distribution of how many candies that Sarah gets without caring about how she actually got them, right? So to calculate this marginal PMF of how many candies Sarah gets, we use the law of total probability to sum over all possible ways that Sarah chooses uh, how many candies that she gets, uh, either by tossing a coin or throwing in dice, and then summing over this joint distribution of z and x. Note that this is just a joint distribution of z and x. Additionally, remember that she tosses a coin with 40% probability, and that she throws a dice with 60% probability. Now, I would encourage you to pause the video here and try to calculate this marginal distribution on your own. As a hint, I would suggest that you first calculate the joint probability of z and x by filling out this table here and using this expression here for the joint probability. Additional things that I would like for you to consider while doing this is how can we go from the joint distribution to the marginal distribution by using this table here. And can we also find the conditional distributions in this table? If you pause now and try to answer these questions on your own, I will go through the answers with you when you get back. So now I hope that you've been able to solve this. Now what I would do is that I would start by calculating this joint probability here. And we know that we can express this joint probability using the product rule like this. So if we look at this cell here, we have the probability that she tosses a coin and gets zero pieces of candy. Now, the probability of getting no candies, if we condition on that she tosses a coin, is 0 0.5, right? And the probability that she tosses a coin from the first place is 40% or 0 
So here we have 0 0.5 times 0 0.4, which is 0 0.2. Now the probability that she tosses a coin and gets one piece of candy is the same. So we also have 0 0.2 here. However, she cannot get more than one piece of candy if she tosses a coin, so all of these probabilities here are zero. Similarly, if we look at the probability of throwing a dice and getting a certain number of candies, she has equal probability of getting one, two, three, four, five, or six pieces of candy, which is one over six, for this conditional probability here, where we condition on that she is throwing a dice. And the probability of throwing a dice is 0 0.6, right? So all of these values here are 1 over 6 times 0 0.6, which is 0 0.1. And there is zero probability of throwing the dice and getting zero pieces of candy. So this should be zero here. So how do we go from the joint probability here to the marginal probability of said? Well, our aim is to get the probability of just said, and by using the law of total probability, we sum out the dependency on x by fixing said and summing over all possible values of x. And if we look at this table here, we do this by looking at one of the columns here and then summing over the rows. So we get the marginal probability of said by summing over the rows for each column. And while we are at it, we might as well verify that this holds true for the marginal distribution of P of X. So, which we get for each row by summing over the columns instead in this table. Now we see we get 0 0.4 for, for tossing a coin, which seems reasonable. And we get 0 0.6 for throwing the dice which also seems reasonable, right? This is what we expected from the beginning. Now, I also promised that we could find these conditional distributions in this table here. So this conditional distribution here, the distribution of pieces of candy that Sarah gets, given that we condition on the method that Sarah uses. And as I mentioned before, we typically view this as a function of said for fixed value on x, which is known. Now, if we look at this table here, for a fixed value of x, let's say that Sarah tosses a coin, we can see that this row here is proportional to the marginal distribution of pieces of candy that Sarah gets, given that she tosses a coin. And we can also see that the proportionality constant that we need to divide by in order for this to be a proper density is 0 0.4, which is the probability that Sarah tosses a coin. Similarly, this row here is then the conditional probability of said given that Sarah throws a dice. And again, the proportionality constant we get by summing over all of these which is 0 0.6, which is the marginal distribution that Sarah throws a dice. Now we can also get the marginal distribution of x given that she gets a certain piece of candy which we then find on the columns here. So this for example is then proportional to the probability of x given that she gets five pieces of candy.